We will be traveling now to Greece. I'm pleased to introduce the next session on inclusive and sustainable economic growth and human well-being. And pass the floor to the network manager of SDSN Greece, Lydia Papadaki. Lydia? Welcome to UNSDSN Greece session. I'm Lydia Papadaki, the manager of UNSDSN Greece, which is chaired by Fifi Kunduri and Andreas Papandreou, who will take part in our panel. Our session focuses on an disciplinary understanding on how happiness connects with the SDGs and how they can help the recovery of the crisis. So now I will ask our audience to raise your hand if you've heard the SDGs in the past. So if you can see on the on the right, on the right bottom, there is a small hand. So please click on this small uh, orange hand if you heard in the of the SDGs in the past. Let's see. Let's see how many have heard. Okay, until uh, I give you time to click on the hand. Great. Okay, as I see, not many have heard of the SDGs so far. Well, good to know. And now, before introducing our panelists, I would like to run a poll. Uh, which will show up on your screen and where you can choose the continent where you're coming from. So let me see. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the countries. Yep, there we go. And here it is. So until you until you answer the until you answer the poll, uh, I let me introduce you to our panel. Um, I give you great, great, great. So yeah, you have time. So chair of our session is Professor Fivi Kunduri, who is professor of economics at Athens University of Economics and Business. She's president of EAD, co-chair of UNSDSN Greece director of EAP Climate Geek Hub and advisor to the European Commission for the Implementation of the European Green Deal. So when the poll is down, you will uh, you'll have the chance to, to see them again. Our panel is composed of Prof. Andreas Papandreou, who is a professor of economics at the National and Capodistrian University of Athens and also co-chair of UNSTSN Greece. Uh, Prof. Nikita Spitis, who is a full professor in financial econometrics at the Department of Banking and Financial Management of the University of Piraeus, and he's also partner in AssetWise Asset Management Company. Uh, also here with us today is Prof. Nikos, uh, professor Nikos Tadosiu, who is professor at the Division of Hydraulics and Environmental Engineering of the Department of Civil Engineering of the Aristotel University of Thessaloniki, in Greece and Director of Water Resources Engineering and Manage Management Laboratory. Also, he's Chair of the SDSN Black Sea. With us is also Professor George Pavulatos, who is a Professor of European Politics and Economy at the Athens University of Economics and Business and General Director of the Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy. Professor Stelios Virvidakis, who is a professor of philosophy at the Department of History and uh, Philosophy of Science of the National and Capodistrian University of Athens. He's also a member of many uh, philosophical societies and of the steering committee of the Federation Internationale de Societe Philosophique, representing the Greek philosophic, uh, Philosophical Society. And last but not least, Professor Vasa Kindi who is Professor of Philosophy of Science at the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the National Capodistrian University of Athens. She is also a founding member of the Hellenic Society of University Women and has served on its board. So it's time to close the poll and see. As we can see, uh, most of you are coming from Europe with uh, some with a 20% coming from Asia and uh, a 4% from Australia and a 4% from America and 1% only from Africa. So there we go. So don't forget, mean, uh, don't forget that there is a Q&A so at the end. So please add any questions you have at the chat box on the on the right. Now let me pass a, close my camera and call Professor Fivi Kunduri to open up the discussion.
So I'm continuing by saying that according to the World Happiness Report, happiness is a better measure for a nation's progress than GDP. And uh, using social well-being as a goal drives better public policy. And this is a result that is coming um, up uh, in each and every of the eight World Happiness uh, Reports that have been uh, concluded until today. I do hope that this will be an exciting session, searching answers uh, to uh, questions like how is well-being uh, to be understood and what are the main subjective and objective components of happiness, what are the weaknesses of GDP as a measure of well-being, if improvements in well-being and happiness are going to be achieved via this uh, uh, sustainability transition, uh, via the implementation of the uh, 17 Sustainable Development Goals of Agenda 2030. How are we going to use this agenda, which is currently the only global? And what would be the role of public finance in this recovery? And in addition to public finance, what would be uh, the um, uh, role of uh, political institutions, global multilateral institutions, European integration. And is it the case that we are on the verge of another debt crisis? And if, is, if this is the case, how can uh, sustainable development and the SDG allow us to identify a roadmap that uh, will allow for me uh, as an introduction to this session the current pandemic the current health crisis kind of clearly proven the ability of governments to take dramatic measures to mitigate existential threats and it's also shown that people have the ability to adapt to new restricted lifestyles. We've also seen that the timing of the enactment of measures is crucial for the effectiveness of saving lives and that more uh, that the response to this health crisis came from national states rather than international organizations. Three, these are three main observations that will also guide our discussion today in terms of what is possible and what is not possible. Um, so, uh, Kinti, Vaso Kinti, and and, and Professor Stelios Virvidakis to open their camera and start um, our discussion with regards to the conceptual analysis of well-being. Um, uh, Stelio Vaso, very nice. Uh, so, um, Stelios, I would like to ask you, how is well-being to be understood and to what extent people in different societies, cultures uh, and different cultures diverge in their understanding of happiness and also how is morality related to happiness? Uh, well, this is a very complex discussion, you know, as a philosopher I have to uh, express, you know, certain worries about about how well we can deal with these conceptual issues in in a few minutes. But let me just give it a try. Uh, I would begin by uh, remarking that the very notion of well-being is part of a web of interrelated uh, uh, concepts and notions, which one has to probe carefully in order to understand what we are dealing with. So let me just mention some of them. I mean, you, we've already mentioned happiness, but 
there are other uh, concepts that have been used in this context, like quality of life or welfare or having a meaningful life or succeeding in life, a successful life, living well and having a good life. And this is quite complicated precisely because of the semantic depth of these concepts, which comes from history and different cultural traditions. As you said, uh, there seem to be divergences in the understanding of these issues. Just to give you a, an idea, uh, being Greek, you know, we use this term eudaimonia, which comes from Aristotle, and we tend to think that this means the same as our contemporary notion of happiness. Now, happiness seems to refer to a mental state, some kind of inner state. But for Aristotle, eudaimonia was a kind of objective understanding of the flourishing of a human being. A me flourishing meaning here the realization of one's potential. Now, well-being should be understood within this context. And I know that economists and politicians, you know, are impatient and they, they just try to just provide practical ideas and solutions and measurement. But being, again, being a philosopher, I have to, uh, you know, uh, think about, about the difficulty of measuring these, these things. And just to give you an idea of the differences and divergences due to uh, cultural context. Uh, I mean, nowadays, talking about um, uh, the, the, the virus crisis, the coronavirus crisis, uh, we have uh, noticed how different governments have implemented measures. I mean, taking China uh, and, and, and the kind of approach that the Chinese have uh, uh, implemented, and which seems to be quite effective, now, many Europeans and philosophers, but not only philosophers, express a worry that this uh, approach, which is uh, to some extent, we would say, uh, you know, authoritarian or somehow interfering with people's everyday lives too much in order to protect them. Uh, in a way, it, it is being paternalistic to some extent. And I know I have Chinese friends who seem to be quite satisfied and accept these, these uh, limitations, uh, uh, which are excessive by European standards. Uh, and they actually, they, they criticize us for not being strict enough in our measures. Now, this gives you an idea of, of what you do in a time of crisis, and this uh, helps you understand uh, how different people, uh, how different an outlook people may have regarding uh, their well-being and what it means to have well-being. Now, as you said, there are subjective and objective dimensions to these concepts and issues. They have to be interpreted in different ways. And I think Vaso will also talk about that uh, to some extent. But, but uh, 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 the question is, can we find some objective indicators uh, uh, which would help us? Uh, we, we, we all agree that maybe the meaning of our lives and the quality of our lives is understood also subjectively through one's self-perception and, and self-awareness. But still, I think most people East and West, in, in the East and in the West would agree that there seem to me some some basic needs, and if if well-being is interpreted as involving satisfaction not only of desires but of needs that seem to be more or less basic, then we can take it from there. Uh, let's say as a minimum. Let's say that would be a minimal conception, and move on. Now, psychologists sociologists and economists have given such indicators. I would like to mention Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, famous social uh, you know, psychologist, or Amartya Sen's and Martha Nussbaum's uh, capabilities approach, which stipulate that you have to uh, satisfy some basic things regarding life, health, 
you know, sustenance, minimal sustenance, and then take it from there and move on to, you know, uh, uh, so social needs of affiliation and then, and then self-actualization. But also, just not to forget what you pointed out, there is an ethical and political dimension to all this. Now, uh, again, for us Europeans, uh, there seems to be a, a, a sensitivity to democracy and, and, and somehow securing certain uh, democratic, uh, um, let's say, a certain democratic understanding of rights and protection of rights. And this shouldn't be jeopardized. I mean, no matter what. Now, of course, I said no matter what, but, okay, life comes first and survival comes first. But morality and moral issues and, 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 and political issues will come in at some point. And one of the big questions, of course, which uh, you have hinted at and which we cannot deal with properly within uh, five minutes is whether one can talk about well-being and happiness if one you know, doesn't pay any attention to moral norms, to respecting other people's rights, and uh, somehow adopt, if one could adopt a very egoistic or egocentric understanding of one's uh, satisfaction of needs and desires. So here again, I would urge us to just study the, the moral and normative aspect of, of uh, well-being. And that's a matter of interpretation. I would say interpretation involving philosophical reflection, just to bring in, uh, you know, uh, uh, my own interests. I don't know if yeah. you want to, to just elaborate on that, but this would be just to begin we, with. We, thank you very much, uh, Steios. It is uh, quite important to know, and especially for us economists and sociologists, the difficulties and the complexities in identifying, in defining um, uh, well-being. Uh, although it, it is quite urgent that we elaborate or enlarge, enhance our measures of well-being, because what we have now as uh, the common, as the norm in terms of GDP seems to be deficient. Uh, but let me continue uh, with uh, Vaso. Vaso, can you please turn on your camera and Stelios, we will come back uh, uh, to you with questions and answers at the end of our session. Uh, Vaso, can you please open your camera? Thank you very much. I would like you to please elaborate further on uh, how we distinguish between objective and subjective, uh, subjective assessments of well-being. And what does this uh, really mean? Is the distinction between life and vios, it's a Greek word, a word meaning uh, something similar to life, relevant to the assessment of well-being? Can we promote well-being from rights? Please, Vaso. Yes, thank you for having me uh, in this webinar. Um, as you said, I mean, we can distinguish between uh, objective and subjective assessment of uh, well-being. And although uh, well-being um, one might say is a more basic concept in comparison to others, let's say happiness, more down to earth. Um, it is still very difficult to define as we, as we just saw. And this distinction between objective and subjective assessment uh, adds a further complication. But le let's see what it amounts to. Um, uh, a democratic government that gets, let's say, a mandate from its citizens to cater for their uh, well-being, either collectively or individually or both, may set certain standards to determine uh, their well-being. For instance, it may prohibit smoking because it's bad for them, or it may impose a lockdown because of an epidemic like the one that we currently experience. Uh, in these cases, uh, the, the government, which uh, uh, assesses our well-being, um, 
consults uh, scientific evidence and uh, assesses our well-being uh, objectively, one might say, but also paternalistically. Uh, it, it knows better than we do what is best for us. Uh, and in that process, it may restrict some of our uh, liberties and curb some of our, of our rights. Uh, now, on the other hand, if we are the ones who assess our, our well-being, we may uh, turn out to be wrong uh, because we may lack information, lack knowledge, uh, lack expertise. And in that case, uh, we may think that uh, our well-being is not identical to what we think it is or what satisfies our preferences and desires. So we see that in both cases, that is uh, in the case of objective assessment and, sec uh, and a subjective assessment, we have good and bad uh, consequences. Also, if we opt for the um, uh, ob objective assessment, we, we may think that we may be acting as a divided self. On the one hand, uh, feelings, emotions and impulses, and on the other, reason or we may be handing uh, over uh, the determination of our well-being to others, to experts, to the government uh, that consults uh, experts, uh, in which case we, we need to consider very seriously uh, what kind of polity we would like to have, uh, what kind of representatives we would like to have, what kind of a mandate we give to them. We need to trust that these uh, people will make the right decisions, uh, both uh, uh, right in the sense both of episte being epistemically right and morally right. Uh, now, if on the other hand, we uh, choose the subjective uh, assessment, as we said, we may go completely wrong and, and end up harming ourselves. Now, I, I want to add uh, one um, more, more thing for the end, uh, and that's actually another distinction that you already uh, mentioned, the distinction be between bare life or naked life uh, and the uh, quality of life or quality life. Now, this is a distinction that we find already in Aristotle and uh, uh, and Aristotle distinguishes between uh, the, the, word, the Greek word zoe, as you mentioned, which, is, um, which signifies um, biological life or bare life, and then uh, bios or vios, which signifies a certain way of conducting one's life. Uh, now, this distinction has been picked up by contemporary philosophers who claim that uh, we may not, we should not actually give prominence to uh, this bare life in uh, this regard of other concerns um, that uh, make up uh, quality life. Uh, now, one might say that if we concentrate too much on biological life, we settle for a kind of animal life, a, a mere life, not a good life, not a meaningful life. Uh, my problem is that how could anyone think of other concerns and values if bio biological life is eliminated? I mean, this is a concern now with the health crisis that we have. And in my view, these thinkers who show this contempt for um, this so-called bare life are very uh, have a very presumptuous attitude, arrogant attitude, and and paternalistic, and uh, they they look down upon people who only have their bare life as a valuable thing, uh, and so I think it is very dis disrespect uh, disrespectful to uh, look down on people who simply try to survive. And I think we should actually stand in awe uh, at this uh, at this subjective assessment of well-being and do whatever we can to help. Thank you very much, Vaso. This is very interesting. Um, 
especially given the fact that the world uh, happiness reports are based on data from subjective evaluations of well-being they are based on data from life evaluations coming from the gallup world poll and uh, this is the basis of the annual rankings of uh, the happiness report and uh, they find that individuals with higher levels of interpersonal and institutional trust fare significantly better than others when negative situations are um uh, occur and these negative situations including ill health like uh, the one that we are uh, facing now and uh, your discussion on what is essential and uh, what is um, uh, what is respectful to be considered essential is uh, very central in this discussion uh, we will come back to you, Vaso, with uh, questions and answers. Thank you very much. I would like now Andreas, uh, Professor Andreas Papandreou, uh, Professor of Political Economy, to open up his microphone and uh, try to introduce us into the economics of uh, well-being and in particular um, point out the weaknesses of gross domestic product of, of uh, GDP as a measure of well-being. Uh, what are the weaknesses of GDP and what are the weaknesses of the preference-based approach to well-being that has dominated our work as economists? And um, what in general are the failings of methodological individualism and how all these uh, can be connected to our, our way towards sustainability, to our efforts uh, towards the sustainability transition and the implementation of the SDGs? Well, thank you, Phoebe. Uh, quite a lot of questions there, but I think I'll manage within a short period of time to at least uh, uh, say a few things about, about all of those questions. Also, let me make a brief correction. Uh, I did interrupt the previous uh, webinar, uh, but, it, but I'm not a prime Mr. minister of Greece. I, 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 I look very much like the ex-prime minister of Greece. He happens to be my brother, but that just, just so that People don't think that the, the ex-Prime Minister of Greece is speaking right now. Um, okay, well, let me let me uh, try to address those issues. And of course, they tie in also, I think, nicely with some of the comments and deeper discussions uh, provided by our philosopher colleagues. Um, governments often measure their success by GDP growth. So the pursuit of GDP growth strongly influences policy decisions. Now, to the extent that GDP measures an economy's capacity for generating material wealth, it does capture an important element of human well-being. But there's always been a debate about whether it is a good or adequate measure of human well-being. The father of GDP, Simon Kuznets, was the first to highlight the dangers of treating GDP as a measure of, of welfare. And in fact, he said, and I'm quoting here, distinctions must be kept in mind between quantity and quality of growth and, being the, and between the short and long run. Goals for more growth should specify more growth for what uh, and for what. So um, one can offer actually a long list of important elements of well-being that are completely missed by the GDP index. But I will mention four for reasons of brevity. Um, sustainability, even in purely material terms, in other words, the continual uh, growth of material uh, goods, is not ensured by a series of high GDP growth rates. It's not the quantity of growth, but the quality that matters too. Financial crises that are often preceded by high rates of growth 
are in fact a harsh reminder of how misleading and ephemeral these achievements can be. Of course, we in Greece uh, did enjoy high growth, uh, rates of growth of GDP, GDP prior to the major crisis in, in, in 2010 for us. Uh, and that precisely shows how unsustainable uh, growth can be. Now, an economy, a second point, an economy can grow fast for many years and still destroy its natural and environmental capital. Climate change is the most dramatic example of how wrong we could be with a narrow focus on GDP. Inequality in its many forms is not captured by GDP. Inequality can erode the political and institutional foundations of an economy, and we are certainly witnessing this with the rise of populism. Uh, social capital in the form of well-functioning institutions and citizens' trust that you mentioned, Phoebe, in terms of the happiness report, and I'll, I'll mention again soon, including the capacity of a society to protect its most vulnerable, is not captured by GDP. The COVID epidemic has attested to fundamental failings, even in our otherwise wealthy economies, to adequately protect its citizens and especially its most vulnerable citizens. Now, SDG 8 recognizes the importance of economic growth, but overcomes a narrow focus by adding the terms inclusive and sustainable in front of economic growth. Now, moving to some of the other questions in terms of the weaknesses of the preference-based approach of, of uh, economics, and also uh, eventually on its focus on, on the individual, which I think is part of the problem, the weaknesses in GDP as a measure partly reflect problems in a traditional emphasis in economics on individual preference attainment as the overriding measure of welfare. Richard Easterlin, the father of happiness economics, noted in 1974 that data on subjective well being, happiness, did not increase over time as income increased. Now, following that tradition, SDSN has been publishing an annual World Happiness Report. And as Phoebe mentioned in its most recent report, it found that higher levels of social and institutional trust are essentially as important in raising happiness and reducing inequality. And also behavioral and experimental economics have suggested that people may fail to act in, a, in ways that advance their own goals. So two key points here are that income alone may not be an adequate measure of happiness, and that even if individuals appear to be able to better attain their individual wants through higher incomes, they may not be happier. Now, again, another point raised earlier by, I think, both uh, Stelios and Vassal, the Nobel laureate Amartya Sen has, em has emphasized, so um, as I said, Amartya Sen emphasized other weaknesses in a, a single-minded focus on attaining individual wants or even happiness. He points, points out that people in poverty may adapt their preferences to make life bearable. The ease with which society could improve their sense of attainment or even happiness does not justify providing little. Ensuring many freedoms and capabilities for all are critical elements of our well-being. For instance, protection against epidemics and adequate health provision, protection against hunger and unemployment, partition, participation in political decisions, protection of liberties. These aspects of well being may enhance our subjective sense of well being. So, happiness indicators may help reveal many other dimensions of our well being. Some of these are the objective uh, accounts that uh, both Vaso and, and, and uh, Stelios mentioned. Now, there's another aspect of malleability of preference that can be positive and needs considering. Economics generally takes its starting point with individuals and sees societies as an aggregation of individuals. However, sociology and philosophy reverse the equation. Society comes first and the individual is a social construct. We are born into a society and we are raised educated and molded by those around us in the language and norms of that society. Now, in this view, our preferences are malleable because finding a way to cooperate with others is more important 
than simply advancing a particular personal desire. Our characters and goals are shaped by our need to interact with others and gain their respect and become effective as part of a group. We identify with groups and even sacrifice for our team. In a sense, we form our character to solidify our reputation for social interactions. The individuals are fundamentally a social construct uh, and that, that they are doesn't mean that it diminishes the normative importance of individuals, but it does highlight a weakness in unduly emphasizing preference attainment as being the measure of well-being. It suggests a need to better understand how our institutions strengthen our capacity as citizens and allow us to attain goods that we could not as isolated individuals, including friendship, support, respect, appreciation, participation in common endeavors, and forming common goals and preferences. Now, perhaps it would help us better appreciate also the importance of many institutions like the United Nations, the World Health Organization, or democracy, that are being attacked and potentially eroded by populists like Trump and Orban. These institutions are a reflection of what we have built together and a test to our capacity to cooperate. It is our capacity to cooperate that will give us the means to address many of our sustainability cha challenges like climate change and epidemics. I presume I see you, Phoebe, because I've gone on too long. No, right? you're just on time. You, uh, it's just the time that I intervene and I, I uh, continue the discussion and then we Perfect. are coming back uh, to you with questions uh, uh, from the audience. Indeed, uh, the, uh, the dependence of, uh, of people on social environment and, institution, and institutions, like you said, it's a crucial uh, uh, result. It's one of the main results of these happiness reports. And uh, it is one failing of the current economic paradigm if it cannot incorporate that dependence uh, in the economic analysis. And uh, speaking about economic analysis, I would like now to proceed to more practical aspects of how um, our way of understanding the society and the economy uh, will allow us uh, to become sustainable and uh, face uh, even the current crisis in a sustainable way. Uh, it is uh, well documented that the measures that can help solve the health crisis that we are now facing can make the economic crisis worse and vice versa. The aim of health related measures. Uh, mainly strict social isolation, is to spread the pandemic out over time and effectively flatten the curve of the pandemic. Flattening the curve of the pandemic by uh, time for raising the capacity of our healthcare sector, but this exact act, this flattening of the infection curve, inevitably steepens the macroeconomic recession curve and puts in danger all supply chains, including those that are crucial for our survival, food and medicine. So uh, my question to uh, Professor Pittis, uh, who is uh, working on uh, financial analysis and financial markets, and um, is also um, an analyst of uh, public responses, uh, uh, responses uh, to crisis. Uh, my main question is, uh, what can we do to avoid uh, this pandemic turning into a major economic and financial crisis that will long outlast the health crisis? And uh, should we now worry again about the level of public debt, Professor Peters? Yes, uh, hello to everybody. Um, uh, I think uh, the best way to 
to to gain a perspective of the whole situation is to to realize that we face a trade-off between health risk and economic risk which means that in order to reduce health risk by one unit uh, we have to increase economic risk by x units and the question is how large this x is if it is prohibitively large then we have to to to, to choose between uh, life itself and the quality of life the problem uh, the problem is that uh, we don't know much about the the characteristics of the virus so it's very difficult to make any any reliable forecast for the time being so the the, the, the big risk is that um, we are going to face uh, multiple waves of this epidemic uh, which means that uh, once the measures, the lockdown measures are relaxed, the, the virus will re-emerge, uh, which in turn uh, will require the policymakers to reintroduce the lockdown measures, and so on and so forth. So we have entered, we have just entered an uncharted territory, uh, in the context of which we are we, we are going to 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 face some uh, tough choices. Uh, speaking of uh, of the debt and the debt sustainability, uh, I am afraid that this is the number one problem of the world economy: the the, the, to, the total debt, both private and public debt. And the bad thing, the unlucky, the unlucky thing is that the world economy uh, faced a serious debt problem already before the coronavirus crisis. And uh, the current debt problem has its origins in the wake of the great financial crisis of 2008. What happened then? Uh, due to the financial crisis of 2008, central banks around the world tried to fight the, the recession, first by adopting standard expansionary monetary policies such as interest rate cuts. However, these policy makers, the monetary authorities, soon realized that these uh, conventional measures were not sufficient to produce uh, economic recovery. Uh, so they had to invent the so-called non-standard monetary policy measures, uh, such as quantitative easing. Uh, quantitative easing was also necessary in order to, to bail out the American banks, which were severely hit by the crisis. Now, what is quantitative easing and what uh, are its effects? What its effects are? Quantitative easing means that the central bank buys long-term sovereign bonds and other financial assets such as, such as uh, mortgage bank securities in order to bring long-term interest rates down. down. By doing so, however, they set the policy makers, the monetary authorities, set another mechanism in motion, uh, namely yield, yield hunting. What is yield hunting? Uh, institutional investors, international investors around the world, such as uh, insurance companies, pension funds, or private investors, could not find adequate yield in risk-free investments. Now that, the, for example, the the yield of 10-year government bond if it approaches zero and I'm an insurance company or a pension fund, I'm trying to find other sources of yield. So uh, I started to invest in assets like corporate bonds, including risky corporate bonds, which uh, offer me some decent yield. Uh, but um, the compensation for this yield is to undertake huge excessive uh, financial risk. So by, uh, by, by buying these corporate bonds or other instruments, I drive the yields of these uh, financial assets further down. So at the end of the day, uh, we, we end up in a world that the interest rates or the yields of uh, most financial assets are, 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 are in the vicinity of zero. It's important to, to bear in mind that, uh, speaking of uh, the sovereign debt, most European, northern European countries, 
face negative yields, negative nominal yields, which is a, a phenomenon very difficult to explain. In the past, we faced, uh, we, we had, uh, we witnessed uh, periods in which the real yields were negative, meaning that the nominal yield minus the inflation rate is negative. But uh, a period of nominal negative yields uh, is very hard to find in, in the history of the, of the financial world. So, uh, what, so companies and the private sector found, uh, found out that they could borrow cheaply. And uh, not surprisingly, they did so on a massive scale. So at the end of the day, both uh, governments and the companies and households uh, piled up a huge amount of, of debt. And that was the situation before the financial, before, before the coronavirus crisis. Now we are entering uh, another thing to, to, to bear in mind that is that the, 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 the central bank action uh, in the form of the quantitative easing cultivated, cultivated the bailout culture. And uh, a culture that is, which may, may, may be uh, put in the terms of it's too big to fail. So, uh, but the, the problem is that, that most bailouts before the, the 2008 financial crisis tended to be less than $10 billion uh, in today's inflation adjusted term. The great financial crisis moved us from $10 billion being the, the, the amount of the bailout package to a trillion being the new bailout currency. Now, the new COVID-19 crisis has moved us towards 10 10 trillion plus big being the bailout currency globally. So these extremely low policy rates that uh, was followed during the last decade has left us with uh, ever higher and higher debt requiring uh, the bailout numbers to also go higher and higher on any outside shock. So uh, the intervention, the, the amount of money that the COVID-19 shock will require is in the vicinity of multiple of trillion of dollars of intervention to protect the current system. So the problem is that uh, uh, the debt uh, generates new debt and we are entering a, 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 vi a, a vicious uh, circle, a vicious cycle in the context of which in order to, to sustain the current debt, you need to create more debt. And the problem is that uh, when the debt servicing uh, uh, ratio is, is relatively low, which means that as long as the interest rates are low, then the debt overhang is not, it's not such a severe problem. But uh, if the interest rates go go up, for example, interest rates might go up because of a rise in the risk premium around the world, then debt servicing ratios, be, debt, debt, debt servicing becomes even more difficult. And uh, uh, this is when uh, the sustainability issues arise. Currently, uh, we don't expect the interest rates in the advanced economies to go up because the mismatch between savings and investment uh, is, uh, is is likely to persist. We have the so-called global uh, savings glut, uh, a lot of savings and very, very, very few uh, demand for investments. But the problem, the problem is going to, to, to show in the emerging markets that uh, emerging markets are now facing severe debt servicing problems. Uh, because, um, because of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, there is a huge outflow of capital from emerging markets, which makes, uh, which makes the, their life very difficult in terms of uh, financing their deficits, both budget deficits and current account deficits. And the problem becomes even worse because uh because of the collapse in commodity prices uh the last uh, two or three days we witnessed uh, another uh, paradox which is um, 
uh, a commodity uh, having a negative price and uh, not uh, any commodity but oil yesterday and uh, the day before yesterday the price of oil entered negative territory if you believe it so we live in a world full of paradoxes we we live in a world in which the nominal interest rates are negative we live in a world in which commodity prices become negative and uh, we the, the only reason that we don't uh, uh, start screaming out what's going on here is because uh, we are getting used to these uh, paradoxes slow by slow uh, and because we get used to them uh, we don't we don't uh, treat them like paradoxes anymore but they are so the world is not well pre well prepared the economic world is not well prepared is not fit enough to withstand the new crisis the new lo the, the looming crisis of covid-19 and uh, uh, i personally am quite pessimistic about the, the degrees of freedom that the policymakers have to, to, to respond effectively to this, uh, to this crisis. And also bear in mind that uh, we are in a totally different, the, the initial conditions that we now face are quite different than those uh, before the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, back then, there were plenty of monetary space. The interest rates were 5%, five, 5%, so the monetary authorities the, where, uh, had the facility of uh, reducing the interest rates from 5% to 0%. Nowadays, the interest rates are zero, or in the case of the, of, the, of, the, of the Eurozone rates are negative. So the monetary policy space is severely limited. And so is the fiscal, the fiscal space, with the exception of uh, Germany and some other Northern European countries. Uh, the fiscal space in Greece, in Italy, in Spain, even in the United States, is very limited. So, uh, 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 the dealing or fighting this crisis uh, is going to prove uh, a very difficult task. And uh, I think that's my first. Uh, Thank you very much, Nikitas. Uh, we will come back to you with questions. Uh, you didn't sound very uh, optimistic with regards uh, to the ability of public finances to respond to our current crisis, and you indicate the difficulties that have to do with uh, the uh, fiscal space and the um, continuing uh, uh, new paradoxes that we need to face um, during um, in our way towards uh, facing this new crisis. And it, it seems that we have a, a, a situation uh, that um, it will be uh, really difficult to avoid another debt crisis. And uh, it will not be easy to recover from this uh, health and economic crisis in a way that it is uh, sustainable, in a way that makes sure that uh, uh, we uh, direct uh, finance uh, towards those that are socially, economically, and environmentally sustainable with such uh, those that have a profile of being able to support sustainable solutions, both uh, with regards to finances, with regards to the economy, to, with regards to social cohesion, and also environmental uh, resilience. And um, it seems like uh, institutions and politics will be uh, crucial in this aspect. And for this reason, I would like to ask my colleague at the Athens University of, e of Economics and Business, Professor George Pagulatos, to open his camera and um, uh, discuss with us the politics of our way uh, towards implementing Agenda 2030 and the and also whether such a sustainability transition can ease our way forward uh, towards recovering from the current crisis. George, uh, as I mentioned before, one of the 
uh, messages that at least I took from the response to COVID-19 crisis uh, is that uh, the response, the measures came from national state, states, while international organizations seem to lack in terms of ex explicit imminent response. Uh, what is the relevance of a state in handling um, uh, crisis? What is the relevance of state in being able to tackle systemic change, the one that we seem to be needing, especially after what we heard from uh, both Andreas and Nikitas on the uh, uh, mounting uh, uh, paradoxes that we are facing in the economic and financial world. And what is the relevance uh, in general of political factors in sustainable development? What's the relevance of global multilateral institutions? Uh, what's the relevance of European integration for both our sustainability transition, but also our ability to respond to crises, existential crises, like uh, the current crisis that we are facing. And um, what is effectively the importance of cultural and value factors such as trust? These are questions that are also coming from our audience. Uh, we are uh, receiving many questions that have to do with uh, the institutional capacity of nations and their ability and the ability of these institutions to contribute to um, happiness and sustainability. So, George, the floor is yours. Thank you, Phoebe. So that's a, that's a big play. Um, to start from trust, your final point, um, and it also goes back to a lot of what has been said by the previous speakers. Uh, trust is about allowing people to cooperate it's about allowing people to trust the, the main institutions with which their societies operate trust is important in that sense in delivering uh, broader cooperation both in the business sphere and in the voluntary sphere in the in the non-market sphere of society but it's also very important in allowing people to operate as citizens uh, with a minimum a necessary minimum of trust vis-a-vis -vis the government and vis-a-vis the public institutions and we see this kind of um, of need today much stronger even in the eyes of those who doubted it uh, when it comes to the moment of citizens um, taking the kind of um, instructions uh, that they are receiving by the governments and the health experts and following them in order to save lives and to save their life among others um, you need a level of trust in society to be able to trust the government instead of a populist demagogue uh, or to trust uh, a health expert instead of a charlatan. Of course, the problem is when your government is run by a populist demagogue, and we have this problem in, in certain countries, and we see how they are failing also in terms of government response. We see that uh, in, in the Trump administration, we also see that um, uh, to a certain extent uh, in the Boris Johnson administration. Um, the this crisis has been the moment for nation states. I think there's little doubt about that. Uh, states are formidable machines of policy engineering and crisis response. At moments of crisis, citizens tend to, to turn to the states. Businesses tend to turn to the states. In normal times, businesses want competition, especially competition the, the, the sort that favors their own interest. Uh, sometimes they also want protection. But at moments of crisis, everyone turns to the state. Uh, for the kind of a minimal backstop or the kind of defense of last resort that the state can provide. And, and this is no, um, there's no different in this crisis, which is much more acute uh, compared to the, um, uh, to the Great Depression. The, the, uh, in fact, no, it's, it's a, a comparable to the Great Depression. It's more acute compared to the 2008 crisis because it's a crisis that is hitting both supply and demand in terms of economy. And it's also a kind of a uh, it's it's a life existential challenge for people. Uh, and therefore, the importance of governments as provider of this protection and security rises even more so. Now, that said, um, 
it is also evident that governments alone cannot do it, cannot do the job, because this is a crisis that um, the pandemic that knows no borders, and it requires cooperation between states, between governments. It requires the um, mobilization of global multilateral institutions, such as the uh, World Health Organizations, such as um, UN agencies. Um, it requires uh, collective responses uh, for many reasons in order to share um, scientific results between uh, government agencies and the epidemic, epistemic communities, scientific communities, in order to protect uh, supply chains, global supply chains, in order to uh, make sure that medical equipment uh, crosses borders and reaches uh, the countries or the regions where it is most needed. All this needs cooperation between states. And I would, I would say that it also needs thriving multilateral institutions. Um, and uh, the, the most um, um, formidable in that sense is the European Union itself. European Union is um, an, a unique historical example of a voluntary cooperation between governments, between independent states, to the extent of pooling significant degrees of the national sovereignty uh, and transferring them to supranational bodies and institutions and functions. Uh, it is the most uh, complete and integrated version of a multilateral and intergovernmental organization. It is not as complete and as deep as a real federation would be. We do not have a real United States of Europe um, as we have the United States of America, but uh, it was quite effective um, taking into account these limitations. It was very effective in coordinating actions between governments, not at the first moment, but it built up this effectiveness. Um, and it is also, I think, quite um, um, uh, responsive to the needs of particular governments, especially taking into account that the areas where collective action is needed are areas where governments have not given competences to the European Union, because health policy is primarily a national competence, a competence of national governments, and fiscal policy, where a lot needs to be done, is also primarily a competence of national governments. And the European Union is not a complete economic union, and that is an unfortunate event, because today uh, we need the kind of microeconomically important fiscal response at the European level that will be able to match the formidable initiatives that have been taken at the pan-European level by the European Central Bank. So um, we are at a time where we need collective action by multilateral institutions, where our European Union um, needs to strengthen its position in terms of policy autonomy and in terms of policy initiative. Um, and we also need to think outside the box in terms of traditional rules and ways of uh, operating because this is a crisis that has turned the world upside down as some of the previous speakers have said uh, priorities that we had policy objectives that we had over the previous decades uh, today have been reversed um, our concern is not inflation anymore it's a liquidity trap uh, our concern is not to maintain a fiscal discipline target it's uh, in fact to provide the fiscal ammunition that is needed in order to restart the economies uh, and so forth and so on um, in these times it is i think a vital challenge not to allow the importance of the state to degenerate into an, an ascendance of nationalism and populism, because there is a, a national, there's an, a, a natural tendency of citizens to seek protection in the national government, and this can very easily transmute into a policy of scapegoating other countries, blaming the Chinese or the Americans or the Europeans or the Germans or the Italians, uh, and this is a very vicious and slippery path. We do not need another slide of humanity and Europe uh, to the slippery and nasty road of, of nationalism and populism. Uh, and especially we do not need to go back to the time where uh, the global community did not have global multilateral institutions, where we did not have the World Health Organization or the UN agencies um, or the various uh, agreements and treaties 
that bring um, countries and people together and allow them to react much more effectively to crises such as the one that we are now uh, going through. Thank you very much, uh, George. I am also a, a, a deep believer in the abilities of uh, of uh, the European Union, and I also think that uh, it comes in when the challenge is too big for national states uh, to handle. And uh, another challenge that uh, is, um, is uh, concurrently being faced simultaneously with the health crisis is the environmental crisis. Uh, these um, are two challenges, uh, very different from one another, but uh, connected in that there is serious scientific speculation that COVID-19 might be uh, connected to climate crisis uh, due to uh, its relation to the loss of biodiversity. It's been uh, speculated that deforestation drives uh, wild animals closer to human population. And as a result, it increases the likelihood that zoonotic viruses will make the cross species live. And for this reason, I bring into our discussion about uh, happiness, sustainability, and our ability to face a uh, crisis, uh, existential crisis, I bring into the picture the, as, the environmental aspects. Um, it's been uh, many years since the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has warned that global warming will likely ac accelerate the emergence of new viruses. And um, it is uh, quite important to bring into the picture how we understand our environmental sustainability and how we integrate environmental sustainability into our, um, in, in, into our socio-political and economic systems. And uh, for this um, reason, I would like to call in my uh, colleague from the Aristotelian University of uh, Thessaloniki, uh, a hydraulics engineer, professor in hydraulic engineering, uh, to introduce um, environmental and natural resource management into our discussion. Um, Nico, um, how do you think the protection of the environment is related to sustainable growth and human well-being? And uh, why is it important to ensure the resilience of our renewable and even non-renewable resources into uh, our measurement of sustainable growth and well-being? And also, why is uh, the uh, resilience of infrastructure uh, infrastructure related uh, to the way we manage our interaction with nature, society and nature, uh, important to uh, sustaining or even improving human well-being? Well, um, thank you very much, uh, Phoebe. Uh, I, I need to start by saying that uh, I really enjoyed the uh, previous discussion and uh, all these issues that uh, were raised by uh, our colleagues are very, very interesting and very uh, to the point. Uh, well, regarding the um, uh, environment and the uh, aspects that you already raised, um, I think we need to start by emphasizing the importance of uh, aligning with the environment uh, in order to achieve and uh, improve our way of life and our well-being. Um, you know, throughout time, uh, humans always consider the environment as an exhaustless pool of uh, supplies uh, that were available just to support our way of living. Sometimes, uh, many times, if I may say, over-exploiting limited resources in a constant demand for much more than we needed. 
um, while our population was relatively small, that was not actually a very severe problem. But now that the population of the Earth is increasing in an uh, uncontrolled uh, rate, this has become, in the last uh, decades, a very, very significant problem. Uh, the need for space, the need for food, for energy, for water, and for other environmental resources is increasing in a rate much higher than the rate of um, renewability of natural resources. Um, this, of course, leads to, leads to a, a constant degradation of the environment. And this is something we, we actually realize. Um, well, what we need to, to actually realize in this, uh, this stage is the fact that uh, uh, it is not only uh, the environment that is uh, degradating through this process, but our, also our prospect for um, a better way of life. We need to realize that um, an uh, inclusive and sustainable economic growth is the only way to ensure human well-being, as this is the title of our uh, discussion right now. We need to adjust our needs related to um, uh, natural resources to the level of renewability of these resources. Uh, this means that we need to establish a balance between what is naturally replenishing the environment and what is uh, being withdrawn from it to cover our needs. Uh, this is actually an, either a win-win or a lose-lose situation. I mean, if we respect the environment, then it will provide for us and help us improve our way of um, living. If we don't, then it will be the other way around. It will further degrade, and so will our well-being. Um, sometimes we think that uh, it is already too late for the, um, uh, for the environment, for the protection, or the rehabilitation of the environment. Well, this may be the case at some level. I mean, it may be late, but I think it's not too late. Uh, what we experienced um, during the past uh, few months with this um, global disaster, the pandemic of uh, COVID-19, was really uh, something unspeakable. So many people have died, so many people have been seriously ill, the economy, as we already heard, is threatened by a global recession. Uh, I'm sure, though, that we have all noticed from our house windows, since we are all in our houses these days, that uh, there was actually a positive change to some environmental factors, at least those with an immediate response, like um, air quality or water quality or uh, noise and several other factors. This means that the degradation of the environment is still reversible, and this is something very important to, to mark. So, as they say, why waste a good crisis? Uh, I mean, we can keep the, the positive impacts to the environment that this uh, disastrous pandemic uh, had caused, and try to pursue them in times of peace, of course, after we, de we deal with the, um, uh, with the virus. So, we can still pursue a rehabilitation of the environment and a better environmental status, better environmental conditions. It's not very, very late. Still, some things are uh, uh, reversible. And um, I don't want to take too much time, so I will make a small remark about the, the last thing that you, you mentioned, the importance of um, uh, infrastructure. Um, I'm a civil engineer, and as a civil engineer, very much involved in the design and construction of um, uh, infrastructure. Uh, sometimes, um, as, uh, as users of infrastructure, we take for granted that um, when we need water, we just um, turn the tap and we have water. When we need energy, we just turn the switch and we have um, energy and so on. But we need to consider where does this come from in order to ensure that um, uh, uh, in order to ensure this um, uh, this provision, uh, we need uh, factories, we need uh, networks, we need uh, plans, we need treatment plans, we need several uh, infrastructure. All these infrastructures are interventions to the environment. And um, we need to consider these um, interventions as part of the environment in order to ensure uh, the uh, environmental protection and uh, all the aspects of the environment that we mentioned um, earlier. We need to, to, to consider them with respect to the environment, 
and in alignment with the environment. And just to, um, uh, to make an example, just to, to close with an example, we know that according to the Paris Agreement and the European Agreed Deal, um, we need to change our energy sources from fossil, from carbon, to renewables. In this way, we will significantly reduce greenhouse emissions and um, limit the extension and the development of um, climate change. Uh, well, one of these alternatives, these renewable alternatives, is uh, harvesting uh, wind energy. Wind farms, though, are not without impacts. Actually, they have significant environmental impacts. And uh, their intervention to the environment often causes reactions from people living in, this, uh, in these areas. So what's our choice? Do we stick with um, uh, fossil fuels and continue to, uh, to pollute uh, the, the environment? Or do we change to, to um, renewable sources taking into consideration that some of them all have uh, also environmental impacts. Uh, the goal actually is to change the environmental energy sources, but following a, a very detailed plan in order to, um, to also reduce their environmental impacts. It's not easy, but after all, what is? Exactly, Nikos. It's not easy. And uh, it is uh, time, I agree with you, that we start investing in what makes our socio socioeconomic system resilience to various crises. And to do that, we need to lay the foundation for a green circular economy that is anchored in nature-based solutions and geared towards public well-being. I do agree that it is time for our economic system to change. And uh, the good news is, like you said, we have our blueprint. We have Agenda 2030, UN Agenda 2030, and the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, together with the European Commission, uh, Green Deal. So we have a way forward and we can make the change. I would like now to qu quickly um, turn to questions that we received. I also want to tell you that I've integrated the questions from the audience in uh, the questions that I addressed to the different speakers. I now have a question for Professor Bittis, which uh, says, um, uh, can you elaborate a bit further on modern monetary theory and explain whether it is possible um, to answer uh, the, to respond to the current economic emergency within the framework of that theory. Uh, can you give a brief answer to this question? Uh, yes, I think uh, we are already implementing uh, the, um, the doctrines of the, the recommendations of the modern monetary theory. B basically, the question is, uh, 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 that relates to what I said earlier about quantitative easing. The question is, whether quantitative easing is debt monetization. And uh, what is debt monetization? Debt monetization is something uh, quite uh, simple. Uh, I am the government and I run a, de a budget deficit. Uh, my expenses uh, are greater than, uh, than the, the tax uh, revenues. So how do I, fin uh, how do I finance my, my deficit? Uh, I issue bonds, government bonds. And uh, the, the healthy way is to, to find international investors who are willing to buy these bonds. Uh, the, non, the, the, the not so healthy way is to have my central bank to print money in order to buy these bonds. So this, uh, the, 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 this, uh, this uh, approach uh, in having my central bank uh, printing new money to buy government bonds is usually referred to as debt monetization. And it's a bad thing. It's uh, usually perceived to be a bad thing because it uh, will, uh, uh, the orthodox economists believe that um, this procedure will inevitably produce inflation or hyperinflation for that matter. Now, uh, it's uh, worth uh, emphasizing that uh, Ben Bernanke, uh, 
when the global financial crisis of 2008 began, uh, assured the Congress that uh, the quantitative easing measures were not debt monetization. And the difference between debt monetization and quantitative easing is that the latter is temporary, whereas debt monetization is permanent. In other words, the, the, the increase in the Fed's balance sheet from quantitative easing was uh, planned to be of a temporary nature. And when the crisis is over, the central bank would start selling the, the, the sovereign bonds back in the secondary market. Now, uh, the quantitative easing, uh, uh, actually the, the money, the, the newly printed money from, from the central bank during the, 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 the last 10 years, basically uh, did not reach the real economy. They ended up in uh, buying financial assets. Uh, why is it, is, it, is it a complicated question? We don't have the time to analyze, but but the, the, the money, the, 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 the new money that central banks printed found its way to, to stocks and bonds, not to the real economy. The monetary, modern monetary theory advocates say, uh, let's do quantitative easing for the people. And uh, what is that? It's more or less what I said before, that the, uh, the, the government can borrow uh, infinite amount of money uh, and having the central bank of the country to buy this uh, uh, this uh, this debt instruments and with this newly printed money the the, the government will uh, do uh, will implement fiscal expansion of uh, any scale that she likes that, or that's like that, that, that's the, the main element of the modern monetary theory and of course uh, of course, any government, any government with a, the fiat money can do that, provided that uh, somehow can control uh, the inflationary pressure. Thank you very much, uh, Nikitas. There are so many questions pop, uh, popping up. Uh, Andreas, are you there? Uh, the audience is asking: Can we es expect the experts uh, in economy, social, and environmental sciences? to provide directions for modifications of jobs and creation of new jobs? What do you think about that in order to respond to the current crisis that we are facing, health, economic, but also environmental? Well, um, uh, the short answer is yes. I do, th I, I do think that uh, economists uh, can think of ways, in fact, that's what they're already doing in many respects, of finding ways uh, in, in, in a particularly challenging time because we're on the one hand actually shutting down the economy and at the same time we're seeing unemployment rates go up because of that need to address the epidemic. So we have this conflicting interest of trying to keep people employed but at the same time keeping them away from their jobs. So that's that's kind of the, the, the new challenge. Um, one way of doing that of course for the short term is to focus on jobs that are needed right now to, to address the, 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 the recent crisis. So that means uh, support uh, delivery of goods when that's not possible by the market itself or not adequately fast. Support uh, the production of, of services, masks, uh, ventilators, uh, increase, increase the, the um, uh, uh, employment of people in the healthcare system, increase the employment of people who, are, who will be able to provide some kind of, of support and monitoring of, of, of people who are uh, uh, in threat of, of, of being infected. So um, th that's a particular challenge because we can't simply say we're going to reopen the traditional elements of the economy, tra tra traditional sectors of the economy, although part of the way we're going to respond now in opening part of the sectors it depend will depend on a good plan which uh, economists have a role to play there on how we start partially opening up sectors, uh, making sure we can test adequately fast, um, to 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 um, uh, make making sure we have the uh, capacity in terms of testing units and and, and other protective gear for uh, services, um, making adjustments even in airlines in terms of the seating so that people keep their distance. So there's a lot of things that can be done. And we have to kind of both capture the supply side and also support those from the demand side in terms of the people who are presently unemployed, 
to have the the funding they need to get what what is important for them. Uh, exactly. More broadly speaking, of course, you know we we, we can extend that uh, more broadly. And and coming back to the point that was made earlier, we can also use the the new phase of fiscal support to to get to to shift the economy towards a more sustainable shift. So not forgetting our more long term um, objectives. And in fact. Part of the problem with the, uh, with, the, with the epidemic is that we forgot that this is a long-term issue. So we're gonna have to ensure in the future that we're prepared for these kinds of potential crises. Yeah, I agree with you, Andrea. And, I, and if I may add, I think that now is the time for financial institutions and governments to embrace EU taxonomy for sustainable investments that was out in 2019 and to phase out fossil fuels by deploying renewable energy technologies to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies amounting to 5.2 trillion per annum and redirect uh, these subsidies to green and smart climate mitigation and adaptation infrastructure projects, invest in circular and low carbon economies, shift from industrial to regenerative agriculture, explore the limits of digital revolution, and uh, reduce uh, our transport needs. So this crisis, uh, COVID crisis, has shown that we can uh, do it. And it is quite important to understand that our generation has lived through a number of crises, financial, refugee crisis, climate crisis, the COVID crisis, if we continue attempting to face each new crisis with the same socioeconomic model that gave rise to this crisis, we are going to fail. So what we need is big thinking, systemic change, and try to vision our future in, uh, in a way that is both uh, financially, economically, environmentally, and socially resilient, inclusive, that is leaving no one behind. And I think this can be summarized, this vision, it has already been summarized in the UN agenda for uh, 2030, the 17 SDGs and the European um, a green deal and within this framework we need to uh, f uh, f um, structure our response to this huge health and economic crisis that we are facing. Thank you very much Lydia, this is, I'm turning back to you. Thank you, thank, thank you, you very much, thank you very much our panelists, thank you everyone for attending our session. Now. For any more information you want, just check our site, unstsn.org, or on Facebook, on Twitter, and on our site for any questions. Now, let me pass the word to Portia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Phoebe, Lydia, and all the panelists for this interesting and inspiring discussion.